Uh, my computer says it's five o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and open the uh, meeting. And does anybody know if Judy is planning on joining us? I assume she is. She's been on email and reviewing and providing feedback on minutes. So I have no reason to think she's not attending. Um, she's at the Cape, I believe. So she may have internet access challenges, but it didn't seem to get in the way of her. Nope, she's email. here. Oh. Admit. There, there she is. Her ears must be burning. Okay. Now the party can start. Okay. We've already opened the meeting and uh, called to order. Uh, the first thing on the agenda is site plan update for Three River Road. Uh, Brent, do you have that? I do. I'm wondering. Um, I don't see any of the representatives of Three River Road here. I did invite them. Didn't get a confirmation of whether they would. Or, I guess we'll. I'll, I guess we can start and see if any of them drop in. Um, so let me share. Let me share my screen here. So let me do. So what I'm sharing, I have both the, so you should be able to see this site plan, which was the original site plan. Let me see if I can make it. Is that, I think I can make it a little bit bigger. Sorry. So this was the original July 27th of you know, basically last year, the plan that we approved. Um, and then I was really hoping that our DMCTC rep would attend so they can kind of walk us through all of these changes. Excuse me, Brent, could you give me that date on this plan again, please? So this is the original plan. Um, it looks like it's dated 2021, July 27th. And it's in the OneDrive folder for Three River Road. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the site plan that they submitted when we reviewed and approved their site plan. And they've, now what I'm gonna share is a, an update that they've sent us dated this year, 2022, July 18th. So it's sort of like, you're, I'm still showing you the old plan and maybe the places where you really wanna focus your attention are in this area, um, maybe a little bit of in this area. So sort of like the north side, the west side, and the south side, all right? So kind of look at this, hold that in your minds for a moment, and then I'll flip to what they've just submitted. Okay. So what appears to have happened, if we look on the north side, what used to be a mobile refrigeration unit is they've still reserved space for it. I'm, I'm gonna flip back to the old plan just so you can, so we're looking here on the north side. So they had originally shown four of these mobile refrigeration units on the north side. All the, I'm hearing, oh, I see Jared is here. Hey, 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 guys, sorry about that. Oops. Um, I, I think I'm on this. Uh, I think I'm on this call now. You guys can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Very good. So, Jared, 
I was just um, in, in lieu of you or your representative here, I was showing like this is the original plan that I'm sharing. You can see this. Yeah. Chart. Yep. And then I was flipping to the, the updated plan and trying to highlight for the board members where it appears there have been some changes. And I think yeah. the real, the, so I'm gonna yield the floor in a moment so you can walk okay. us through in your own words these changes. And just Great. to be clear, I think what we're trying to determine tonight is yeah. whether we're simply going to be able to say, you know, this is okay without a new, um, but with something short of another full formal site review or. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's kind of where we are. Great, okay. So um, in the prior uh, version, the rear portion of the building was identified as part of the structure um, on the original Berkshire design uh, plan. So um, and so you rear, see, well, yeah, exactly this is there. What you mean by the rear? Exactly right. Yes, and so there was a thirty by fifteen um, mobile unit that was there that was affixed to the building, and so what we would like to do in this new plan is replace it with a smaller container that's eight by forty, um, so the same size as a as a standard shipping container, which is itself fewer uh, total square feet uh, than the prior 30 by 15. Okay, so let me just again show people the original plan on the west side. So here it was depicted as, a, you know, essentially a continuous part of the building, um, which was really more for illustration purposes. Is that accurate? Yes, yes. And so when you guys came, we walked through, there was a door that connected the um, the shipping unit to the building that made it part of a single a single space. And I, I apologize, I'm, I'm in the car with, uh, with a small child, so you probably can hear in the background. Okay, all right. So this is again the old plan. So now switching back to the new plan. So again, so you can sort of see how that west side depiction has been altered. But you have so then, not extended uh, so beyond the original line of the, the, the right. building. Right, and, so, and that would be within the setback. We, we're, I think we're fine for setbacks on all of the changes that we've made. We're just, um, I mean, the kind of the summary here is that we're rotating uh, structures 90 degrees. Um, we're staying within the same setback. And then we're moving, uh, we're asking to move uh, shipping containers from the north side of the building to the south side of the building. Okay. Um, so there's an existing thousand gallon propane tank that wasn't visible um, in the original, or wasn't a visible period uh, pre previously because it was in the vegetation and behind a great deal of, uh, behind a great deal of uh, junk um, on the, uh, on, on AI's, uh, facility, so that's now depicted. Okay, where um, is that? That's on the south side of the building. It's the small uh, oblong white shape that's uh, that's there. That's what I'm yeah, showing exactly. right here. Okay, good. that's great. Yes, exactly. Oh, hey Tim, how you doing? Um, okay. And so then, again, just hold oh. on. Just I want to make keep everyone since we are trying to. Un clearly understand the changes from what we originally approved to decide the significance of these changes. I just want to keep walking people back to the original plan and, and make it the same scale so people can follow along well. Okay. All right. So, yeah, so this is the original plan where that tank is not depicted. And in the new plan, it is. Okay. And that's on the south side. And it seems like this is the area of the most significant change where these mobile units were. All right, 
right, so let's look at the original plan on the south yeah. side. So this was right. the original so this, depiction. Right, and so we've moved them east and away from the uh, away from the uh, the setback. Um, um, Okay. The three eight by forty previous shown on the north side of the building. Um, yeah. Sorry, the the four eight by forty containers shown on the south side of the building have been shifted fifty feet east, um, and these are all within setbacks and also entirely within Waitley. Everything that we're doing has been, um, you know, pretty carefully uh, uh, placed so that it remains in Waitley. And people can see on this plan, this line is the Waitley Hatfield board boundary. Okay. Um, so question, Jared, for these mobile units, if I look at the original plan, as I'm now showing, um, were these were these four depicted? Um, I guess it was listed as four mobile refrigeration units, eight by forty, in the original plan here, and and oriented roughly east to west. Um, they were in this depiction. They're not enclosed in any fencing. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, and th there's no um, there's no statutory or regulatory requirement that we do that. Um, okay. We just, out of abundance of caution, put up a fence. Okay. So now I'm going to go back. This what we're still showing here is the old plan, where the container units are basically out in the open, without a fence around them. And now I'm going to switch to the new plan. So this shows. Um, well, really now there are five units or six units and there's a fence around all six. Is that correct? That's the proposal. Yes. Okay. And, and, and just to be, and just to be clear, the only things that exist today are the two, uh, are the two uh, units that are inside the same area as we had previously depicted simply rotated 90 degrees. Okay, so that's uh, these two units is what you're referring to. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then you have plans for four more. Yes, and so this plan is depicting what we would like to do with the next set of uh, shipping containers. So okay. I, I just wanna make sure that, that everybody is clear that we have not proceeded to do this, proceeded to do this. We, we, we have just stayed within the prior approved plan and, and just rotated shipping containers. But sure. in our next, this proposed plan, we are asking to move some of the uh, containers that were previously depicted on the north side to the south side and away from, uh, and away from you know, other residences further from our neighbors. I see. So let me just and, ask, and all of, go ahead, all Judy. All of those containers, all of those containers are the same specs that we saw previously on the plan, they're all cold storage containers. They're all eight by 40 shipping containers. Well, the ones that are there, uh, anyway. The there's, cold there's storage nothing... is the two to the left, is that right? I, I, I'm so sorry, uh, Don, I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said. Yeah. I... The two to the left are Branch has got them highlighted now. So my understanding, I, 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 Jared, I, I, my understanding, I think what Judy's asking is that in this original plan, which I'm going to switch back to. So let's, the original not, let's, plan, not, let's not flip back and forth. Okay. All right. In the original plan, so this is the new plan, sorry. Um, in the I think in the original plan, it was our understanding that all of the mobile units on the south side of the building were going to be, um, you know, they were described as, I think, 
mobile refrigeration units. And now um, the two units that are actually there, is it accurate to say that they are not in fact mobile refrigeration units? Um, yes, they are. Uh, it is accurate to say that. Uh, they are mobile con uh, connexes, uh, shipping containers, and we are using them for other purposes than refrigeration. Okay. But from the outside, you know, they're, from the kind of the the uh, the view of it, um, they are in indistinguishable from um, from shipping containers. Okay. And what purposes are you using them for? We're using them for um, a very similar process to what we would have used the refrigeration uh, containers, which is to 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 uh, store and process material. Cannabis material. I don't, it seems the verbiage on the previous plan indicated that all the processing would occur inside the building. Right, this is for storage, not processing. He just said storage and processing. So yeah, I think it's true that in this new plan, the so that there is now um, processing occurring outside of the what's depicted as the processing building. So uh, now processing is occurring outside in two of these mobile units and other mobile units are being used for cold storage. Still true, Jared? So there is also cold storage inside these units and they are also being used for storage. Right, right. I understand. Is there any processing going on in there? Uh, yes, um, and there would be processing going, there, there could be processing going on inside other, other uh, cold storage units. Okay. All right. Um, so it also looks like what you're proposing to do. So in the area that I've depicted, this is the, the same area you, in your original plan for the four mobile units. But what you, it looks like what you want to do is now expand the, the set of units. You know, it's now gone from four to six, and it looks like the area to, to for all six of these units is, you know, you've extended the rectangle eastward, um, you know, along along the Three River Road processing building. So that area is larger in this plan than it was before. Again, yeah, and we plan. have and we have moved or we have we have eliminated the the containers on the north side of the building. Sure, sure. Okay, very good. Um, so in terms of square footage, is that net out to zero? Um, when you subtract, I, I believe it. Once once you uh, do the exchange, I think it comes out very very close to zero. Uh, but um, I would ask I would ask um, Chris uh, Chamberlain what that is precisely, and I can get back to you on that. Okay. And um, Jared, well, I've got you. Um, the My recollection. Sorry. Go ahead, Judy. Well, no, Tom. Keep I'm questioned of the propane tank, Jared. Is that um, is that privately owned by you all, or is that owned by a, um, a, a propane vendor, and who maintains it? That's owned by AI and Carol. That that's not ours. It was it was there previously. It was just hidden by hidden by the. Um, we, we didn't know it was there. Only upon clearing it did we discover that there was a thousand gallon propane tank back there. So that's and AI and AI. And is it going to be removed or are you going to maintain it? 
uh, our, our expectation is that we will maintain it um, because I think it's being used by the building. And so when we, you know, finally move into the building, um, you know, we would like to make use of it. Um, but, but it is, um, it is going with the building, staying with the building is what I mean. Well, if you look at the original, uh, you can see that that propane thing is visible from the air. Uh, what I'm getting at is ma the maintenance of it. Who's been maintaining it? Who's going to maintain it? And um, oh, uh, yes, it has been maintained by AI and Carol. Is this something we would we would, we would talk to the um, fire chief? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, would you say that one more time? Yeah. Is it is it now that this has been discovered? Is this something that the, that the fire chief needs to be aware of? I, I don't know. I'm just. Oh, he's very that. much aware of it. He, he is absolutely aware of it. So. Um, Chief Hannum has been to the site many, many times. Um, we went through a lengthy uh, uh, permitting process with the state fire, fire marshal um, that involved um, extensive uh, discussion with Chief Hannum. Um, and so he has been through this site um, countless times. Um, so he's, he's very much aware that that is there. Um, and so we, we would take over maintenance of the of the thousand gallon tank. tank that's okay, thank you. And I'll just add My that question. I spoke on the phone with uh, the with uh, Fire Chief Hannum about this property, and he confirmed that he has um, that all of his you know, he has no concerns with how they've been preparing and handling the site, and that all the permits are in order. The building permit application that we saw referenced additional processing containers and also moving a fence, potentially moving a fence, I think. Could you explain that? Thanks, Judy. Yeah, good question. So the fence um, moving would be to extend to enclose the additional containers. So to clarify, the original plan did not put a fence around any of the containers on the south side. So in the new plan, you're going to um, extend the, you know, you have a fence around the two that are there at the moment, and you're gonna extend that fence to enclose all of the units that would be there. Yes, exactly the intention. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that clarification. And the only entry gate would be the uh, double gates on the east side? Um, we would like to have an entry gate to the back side uh, since our, you know, our, our cultivation operation is behind it. And uh, it would make it convenient to be able to access it from the back. And would that be vehicular or just for personnel? Single, single man door. Okay. Person door. Yep. I don't remember what we asked about odor control on the storage containers, but if there's processing going on, that seems a more significant question. Can you talk to that, please? Uh, sure. Um, so these are closed loop, uh, cold storage. Um, there, there, there really isn't much of a smell emitted from these things. It's using uh, butane closed loop processing. Um, that's you know, that's really the only the only activity that goes on there, either distilled oil um, or uh, frozen material yet to be uh, extracted and turned into crude or or butane hash oil. Um, and so the the odor the odor really is is not uh, is not present at at that point. Um, you you need to heat it up. Um, either through, you know, a cart or a, a dab, a dab rig, um, in order to elicit the, in order to elicit the, the smells. So at, at the point that it's, you know, in this space, um, it, it really doesn't have an odor. Um, so, so Don and Brant both visited the site. I, 
I would ask them whether if they hadn't known that, you know, that this is the activity that we are using the site for, uh, that, that there would have been any odor detectable at, at Three River Road. I guess that's, no, well, yeah. That's, that's true. Same. My husband and I drove by Saturday night with the air conditioner on and doors closed and everything closed. There was a noticeable smell driving by. So is that um, so we field, are, or is that what would yeah. be producing odors right now? Yeah, it would be the field. I mean, so it's a, it's immediately adjacent to the to the field, and and we are in the midst of harvest right now. Okay. Um, so Thank this you. is this is this is the most odorous time uh, of year right now. And when we were out there last week, um, even though the wind was coming from uh, the north, and they were harvesting, I didn't notice any. I don't know if you did or not, Brent. I didn't notice an odor. Um, I, also, I will also observe that that is about seven River Road, not three, not five River Road or three River Road. Right. So odor is an issue, but I think what Sarah was asking is, is it possible since we're focusing at the moment on three River Road, and I think the Ju Judy's raised the question of is the fact that there is now processing going on in these containers, is that um, creating a, the potential for a significantly different, um, you know, odor uh, profile than we might have faced just knowing that there was processing going on and closed within a building? Uh, and, I, and I think we- so the yeah, sorry, Brent. And I, and I just want to then separate the fact that it may be hard to de detect whether odors are coming from something going on in these containers versus odors wafting from the field um, at, at Seven River Road. Do the, do the containers um, have uh, air purifying with them as, as in the processing section, the original processing section? These containers, you get the impression that they're just steel boxes. Do they have? Yes, that the the original um, containers did not. the The frozen shipping or the shipping containers designed to hold frozen material had no odor control in them. Uh, all of it was uh, frozen, um, and the material that we handle in in these boxes is also frozen. So so we do a, a type of processing called butane hash oil production. And it requires the input or you know, the predominant way of doing it and the way that we do it requires the material to be frozen, uh, deeply frozen throughout. Um, so the storage containers that were previously uh, approved and discussed would have hold, held frozen material, would not have had filters on them. Um, and similarly, these boxes uh, you know, contain frozen material in them uh, and then the finished product. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's very similar. Okay. One other thing I noticed in comparing the two plans, Jared, is that um, this line of shrubbery and fencing has been relocated further to the south beyond the setback. Uh, this is much of a, I don't think that's, anyway, I'm just curious about that. Um, yes. Um, if, if there's, you know, if there's an, an issue with that, we can certainly talk to Chris about it. Um, I'm not sure there is. I'm maybe, and, and I know Don cautioned me against flipping back and forth. I'm going to respectfully ask Don to give me one more flip. Um, so again, this is the original plan where it put the, the line of 
shrubbery and fencing screening much closer to the 50 foot setback line and and further to, you know north north of the property boundary and the new plan is moving it a little bit further to the south i don't see i don't necessarily see an issue there i just wanted to highlight that in case somebody other than me sees has a question about that But other than that, I don't think I have any further questions about this. And, and maybe before we entertain any motions about what to do, there are some other, see if anyone else on the call has any questions. Does that make sense, Don? So maybe I'll just make it clear that the floor is open if anyone wants to come off mute and speak up if they have any questions about what's uh, what these changes are. And the, the, what the planning board needs to decide tonight is whether um, we, these changes merit a full round of a new site plan uh, approval process with all that entails. Well, hearing nothing, maybe what I'll do is I'm gonna try, I'm going to, I think what I'd like to do here, so far I'm not, I'm personally not hearing anything that is meriting a, a new formal site plan review. Um, because you know, that right now the the building inspector is holding back the building permit, and so DMCTC cannot proceed and move forward with their business until they get that building permit. And so we would be, if we insist on a site plan review, we're going to be adding that delay plus the costs to the um, applicant and to the town to do all of this. Um, but that's just my opinion at the moment. Maybe what I'll do is, so we can have a sort of a formal vote and discussion on the issue. I'll make a motion that I'm actually probably gonna vote against, but I'm gonna move that we uh, schedule a formal site review of this new plan. Could you stop okay. sharing, sharing sure. perhaps? Sure. So I'm, this is sort of a test motion to see what people think, whether we need to go through all of this and sort of to do this in a more formal way. I'll, I'll make the motion that we'll schedule a, uh, formal site review of the new plan. So the question is, and if I guess if, so is there a second for that motion? I'll second it. All right. So then we'll have a discussion and have a vote on whether to do this. And having made the motion, I'll argue against the motion. So I would vote against this motion. I will vote against it too. Uh, you're muted, Sarah. You are muted. You know you're muted. <laughs> the cat came to visit, so I uh, muted. Okay. So I, um, I was very interested if the abutters had anything to say, and none of them have said anything. So, or seem to have issues with the movement of the yeah. fence and the expansion of the fence and the shipping containers. So and I guess the, why I, you know, why, when I having, having been there and looked at it, you know, with all of this happening on the south side, um, you know, adjoining a big open field as far away from a Butters in Waitley, I'm having a hard time personally seeing how these changes impact health and safety and the kinds of things that we are concerned with 
And I am thus finding it hard to justify putting us in DNCTC through a whole new site plan approval process. So is that you're sort of concurring with that, Sarah? I am concurring because it does move things farther away from the abutters and I have, we haven't heard any, anything pro or con from them. So yes, I think this is, moves it farther away from abutters and more towards the open field. Okay. I'll, yeah, there's I'll, a agree. Fence. I'll agree with that on the condition that we get written approval from both the fire chief and the police chief that that these changes don't materially affect anything and i, well, I have to talked like to him personally and he he says I, there's no problem at all i want something in the file don i want okay. this is this is for the file yeah okay and in writing signed or an email but something that we can point to that's for the record, I think that's important in this case. And for all of the security stuff under the bylaw. And I think the other thing I would like to do is express my unhappiness that DMCTC did not come to us before they filed for the building permit, which I think is extremely poor form. Apologies on that, Judy. We will not. Uh, we will not do that again. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Where are you? I'm opposed to the motion. Let's move forward. Okay. So, so I guess we'll um, we'll call for a vote to see whether the motion. So, voting aye means that we're going to do another site plan review. And voting nay means we're not. And if the motion fails, then I think we can um, decide what we're going to do in lieu of a site plan review, which would accommodate Judy's comments. So Don, you wanna run the vote? Yeah, all those uh, in favor, vote by saying aye. I'll do roll call, Sarah. No, but again, we need to have the items from that we need from Judy, that Judy would like from, and me too, from the chiefs. Don, no. Tom? No. Brent? No. Okay, the motion fails. Uh, Judy? <laughs> Judy? No. I'm sorry, Judy. Okay. So the motion fails, and so then what we're going to, so do we need do we need to do a simple a formal vote? Well, I guess we don't, right? We're basically not going to do a. a no, I think we have to approve the changes subject okay. to any conditions we want. Okay. All right. So why don't Judy, you make the or approve motion. the plan? I guess the plan would be. Yeah. Yeah. So make the motion in, so that Mary can note it down. I move that we approve the plan as dated, whatever it is, um, subject to the condition that we have written evidence that the, or written approvals from the fire chief and the police chief that it's acceptable to them. Okay. Okay, and that is dated 7-23-22. And I will, um, second that motion. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, Sarah? Yes. Don, aye. Tom? Aye. Judy? Aye. And Brant? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Very good. Um, so, Jared, as soon as. Yeah. We receive, and I expect Judy is okay with this, we receive emails from the Waitley Fire Chief and the Waitley Police Chief um, providing their uh, approval for the proposed changes that they are consistent, that they're not adversely impacting the health and safety of Waitley residents. 
and upon the planning board receiving those uh, letters or emails, uh, the planning board will then notify the uh, building inspector that we have no concerns with the building permit. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you guys very, very much. Okay. Very good. Um, and ap apologies again on uh, on getting the sequence wrong. It comes from um, uh, just not uh, not knowing the the sequence, the uh, appropriate sequence. But we will not do that again. Sure. Technically, if you change a tree, we're supposed to know. <laughs> okay. Understood. Understood. Okay. Or at least um, thank you for that. Those... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we're, we're on top of that. And I've, in my conversations with the building inspector, he seems to feel that um, he seems to have learned a lesson that his judgments about what's okay and the planning board's judgments about what's okay don't often align. So he has taken the position verbally with me that he really doesn't want to be the arbiter of such things. And so, I took that to mean like, um, if we, the planning board, are relying on the building inspector to make some of these judgments, we may, well, we 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 may find ourselves surprised. He he is paid to be the zoning enforcement officer. I hear you. I'm also telling you what he told me. Yep. I would say that for IE too. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we did talk about is at least trying to improve some communication between both sides about what we are approving and because he seems to feel he doesn't often know what we've approved. So we won't go into this here. Um, I wonder if, let me just look since we're on the subject of marijuana manufacturing, we've completed the piece at Three River Road. We don't really have an agenda item related to Seven River Road, but I note that uh, Tim Smith is here and a butter and a, somebody affected by the, I uh, appreciate Tim's coming tonight. Uh, I reached out after Don and I visited uh, DMCTC's facilities at Seven River Road and at Three River Road. Um, we thought we would, after hearing from Jared and learning about where they are and on the on both both sites, Seven River Road and Three River Road, we wanted to make contact with the abutters. Actually, tried knocking on the door at Thirteen River Road, but nobody was home, and the only I made my best effort to try to reach Mr. Smith, so um, sorry if I upset your daughter by leaving her a voicemail, but I'm glad we were able to get in touch. And Tim, I've shared your letter with the rest of the planning board. Uh, and maybe we, it's not officially on our agenda, but- uh, Why don't we, we move that to a, Brett? Why yeah. don't we wait till we get to other? Okay. Well, is well, that except okay? that Mr. Smith is here, right? Yeah. Would be courteous to. I, I might recommend that we um, make, uh, t yeah, be courteous of Tim's time. And if there's anyone else here who has an issue on this. So, Tim, I'd like to give you the floor to maybe in your own words, say what you passed on to us or you know any other comments that you want to share about your experience as an abutter of the Seven River Road operation. Yeah, sure. Um, well, like I said, my, my biggest concern was going to be the odor coming across. And I didn't realize they were in uh, harvest right now. Um, but it's definitely, you, you can notice it, you smell it. Uh, depending on which way the wind's blowing or if it's a dead wind. Um, but it's definitely there. Um, but there, Jared's been really good. If I have an issue, 
he does address it pretty fast. And um, I, I'll just have to, have to wait and see what the harvest does, I guess. I, I'd have to go a full year, a cycle of full production to really get a t uh, feel of what it's going to do. You know, it's, I think it's early in harvest. I, I just don't know what, what to expect. And I'd hate to make a judgment now until you go through a full uh, growing season from start to end and a full cycle of everything that's going to go on with the greenhouses in production. So, uh, so far, I, I, I don't have a real issue with it. I mean, I think we're early in it, but so far, so good. And, you know, you know, good guys to have as neighbors. I, if I had a problem, they, they address it. So, but I just like to keep it open for the future, you know. With, yeah. um, so I, I don't really have a, an issue with what's going on yet until there's a full cycle. It's been completed, I guess. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. I guess what I, I was relatively newly on the board when all of this came up. And I have to say that I haven't forgotten the comments you made as a, and a, and a butter before anything was there. And it, these kinds of things are very agonizing for a member of a planning board because, you know, I'm not living where I'm not the one who's affected. Um, and it's challenging to balance a butter rights uh, with the uh, interests of the town. So maybe what I really want to convey is that um, I want you to know that we're, I want to keep the lines of communication open so that like the reason why Don and I went out there is because we had no idea over the last year about what's been going on. Um, has it been a problem? We've approved other cultivation and uh, operations in town. And we don't have a lot of experience in Waitley about odor. We don't have a lot of experience about noise. And we know there are other abutters that are concerned and in, for better, or for worse, Tim, you're kind of like, well, I don't want to say canary in the coal mine, yep. <laughs> but, yeah. but you, you are you are our best like noise and odor sensor and our best source of advice about how much of a problem this is, how persistent it is, how annoying it is, um, such that we can do better if uh, in the future. So I really want to make sure that if, if things are going on that are a concern to you, I don't want you to feel like we don't want to hear from you, quite the opposite. Okay. Tim, are you, or have you thought about keeping a journal or sort of a diary or? Uh, no, not really. Incidents? Um, yeah, I could, I could do that. Just jot it down, notes on, on a document on the computer. You know, just keep track of how bad the wind is, how yeah. long, you know. Yeah. How many days it's a problem that kind of thing yeah it's it's odd the odor if there is some, a problem if there's if there yeah. isn't then fine but yeah like when i would, came home I, when i came home from work today i could smell it coming in the driveway but you know an hour in the house and i went back outside in whatever way the wind's blowing it, it took it a different way so it's i don't know i really gotta live with it you know see what a cycle a grow cycle's like um as far as noises it doesn't seem to be any noise other than any other farm would have, it's probably even less noise since it's so much hand, hand operation, so. And, and I'll say that was also of interest, at least to me personally, having been to the Seven, Road, Seven River Road site, you know, they have these electric ventilation fans running blowing to the south. But for example, over at uh, the Green Jeans operation that we approved on Christian, abutters were concerned about fan noise. So I was wondering like, well, are you uh, disturbed by fans running all night long or things like that? So it seems like not. No, my house is far enough away from the greenhouse and behind the barns. You, you don't hear that unless you go out back and then it's just, it's just greenhouse noise. So I, that's not an issue, not for okay. me anyways. Okay. So again, I just want to underscore <clears throat> that um, I don't want you to think of yourself as complaining. <laughs> I think of, I, I want to encourage you to think of yourself as doing a service for the planning board by being there in ways, you know, we can't be 
and helping us understand the kind of impacts that an operation like this, because there is, it, it seems like there is the potential for this operation and others like it to provide additional helpful revenue to the town that we would all benefit from. Um, but it can't <clears throat> come at the cost of making individual abutters lives miserable. So I, I wanna make sure we're not doing that. Great. Okay. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is the uh, upgrades to the zoning map. Yeah, Judy, do you want to have, there's a whole bunch of emails we exchanged with Brian about this. Do you feel like you can summarize that? I was counting on you to have it. <laughs> okay. But well, we obviously I, can, I can do my best. I would like to start off with one item that um, I chatted briefly with Peggy Sloan about the home occupation bylaw change that I was drafting. And and um, oh wait, wait, subject. hold on a second, Judy. Um, yeah. I think we're discussing zoning map. I know zoning I know. map revision. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going on to potential bylaw revisions. Apologies. No, I just wanted to explain why I was talking to Peggy. I we got somehow onto the subject of zoning maps. Oh, we were on the floodplain, and I asked about the overlapping of different um, overlay districts and how that was handled. And she was quite surprised and, and extremely concerned that we were thinking of putting the floodplain district on the map. She said, no, you should not do that. It should definitely not go there because it's the it's the copy at the assessor's office that matters. You don't want that on the map. So that's a very significant change from what we've been talking about and not, not on Brian's memo or emails. I think his concerns, if I'm, the ones I remember that it was, that one, there's some, there are errors and, and I, we can outline those later too. He, he found it hard to read. And I think some of that may be caused by the, the floodplain overlay, but also that it was difficult to, to discern the parcels as I remember. Um, I think he also wanted a, a, a very careful review to see that we, there weren't any other other errors that we had perhaps not caught. And that's so I'm what sharing the email from Brian, um, where I think he did a good job of summarizing his concerns about our official zoning map. Um, So one is he seems like he can't find the official zoning map anymore. Um, there's one posted online that he'd never seen before. Then I was with Brian, our town administrator. Um, uh, we have this, this, I think this still sort of unresolved issue about PPE is Pine Plains Estates. I don't think that's that's resolved. That's very clearly AR one. Okay. Uh, though I think he had some questions about documentation that we have that that's adequate. Not what his email said. He said if Judy's if Judy's uh, outline of facts is correct, then it's AR one. So I think all you have to do is know that the site plan that the subdivision application was filed before AR two was created. <coughs> The, there was no such thing as AR1, AR2. Okay. Um, subdivision, filing the subdivision plan um, supersedes any zoning change. So it's, it was in AR, it was in ag res. Yeah. It is an area with streets, public ways. It's clearly an AR1. 
It never was an AR tube. So it may just be that um, we need to get these facts sort of out of your head and written down. With I sent an of... email to that effect to oh, you and I am. All right, I'll, to, I'll dig that up and make sure that we, we have that. But it seemed like there he did have some questions about the, the readability of the online map. And I guess I took it that there's a, now, there should be an official paper map maintained at town offices. And then there's this online map that seems to be difficult to read. So how do we, you know, is this something where say, we work, we get clarity with Brian about what we need to do in terms of generating a, a, a proper paper map and a proper digital map and then produce those products and? Well, first I would think that we fix the mistakes that we know about. The other, the one that's not there is that uh, Sue Monahan's property is shown as commercial when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, um, let me bring up the map. If you make, let me uh, share it, Sarah. Yes, you should be able to. Okay, so this is the map that's existing right now. And uh, the uh, Pine Plains estate have been uh, corrected. The roads have been put in. Michkowski has been corrected. Um, these flood zones are there for general reference only. Uh, it's, I probably need to put on here that for actual flood zone, you need to use the uh, FEMA's maps. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we could take care of that just by um, with an annotation on here. I think you need to take the floodplain references off. This is a zoning map. And, and if she says you don't want any reference to floodplain zoning on the map, okay. we shouldn't have it. Well, that's so, easy to fix. All I gotta do is turn it off. Yeah. Um, and it, it should have somewhere in very large letters that the floodplain district is not shown on this map. Excuse me? Somewhere it should indicate that the floodplain district is not shown on this map and that app, people should consult the map in the assessor's office for, for its boundaries. All right, so just put a note on there that the flood zone is not shown and where to find it. Yeah, a very okay. prominent note, I would think. All right. You know, so what, what we have is a zoning district that's not on the zoning map and people need to be aware of that. Judy, does that apply to the aquifer overlay districts as well? Or no, 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 no. Those are defined by the map, Okay. by this map. Okay. Don, so with the digital map like this, one of the one of the good things is is that you can uh, maybe if I not get that zoom here. Oh, normally, oh, all right. I'm losing. I somehow I don't have my uh, zoom tools on here. But normally, well, that's okay. We, we don't need to do it now. We should yeah. just talk <laughs> through the suggestions. The other, the other error is was the Wendelowski property. Now the Monahan Which property. The one that was Wendelowski that's now Monahan. It was shown as commercial and it never got rezoned. Right here. Well, it's one of those commercial ones. Huh. Why? 
Yeah. I'm having a hard time seeing that. I think it's- Well, I don't uh, think, I don't, I'm not sure we need to fix it. Yeah. Right now, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sarah right started now, to make a- As far as I know, these have been, this has been approved. And the part that was, they wanted to approve was in here and that has not been approved. Right. Well, it was showing, <clears throat> I mean, Sue Monahan was right. It shows on the assessor's map on, on the diagram on the assessors as being commercial. So I think, just go back and check and make sure. Judy, when you speak of the assessor's map, do you mean like a physical document in the assessor's office or the online GIS system map? <laughs> Both, in the last, last reference I meant the physical one, but um, this last one, I meant the online GIS one. I and apologize the, for not being clear. How does the paper one get produced? And who's I, well, I, I created it in, in uh, ArcMap and export it to Adobe Illustrator and then print them out as uh, uh, PDFs. No, but I think for the floodplain district, it's the FEMA map and they produce it. Understood. We're not. That's agreed. We've agreed. The FEMA map is a separate map. So I'm just right. trying to. But it's, but it's available in GIS, and that's where I imported it from. Because I think there are three places that people are getting zoning district information. Um, there's a physical map that is supposed in the assessor's office or. I'll just say in town offices, that is supposed to be the gold standard or the, the authoritative zoning map. So there's gotta be a physical authoritative copy in town offices, that's source number one. Source number two is what we're looking at here, which is a PDF document that is really for informational use only and is posted on the Waitley website in the planning board page. So that's the second source of information about zoning and zoning districts. And then the third source of information is the ArcGIS map when you turn on the zoning overlays. And it's not clear to me that all of these three sources are aligned with each other <laughs> and more and, and more to the point that the version and the, the authoritative copy in town offices may not be accurate. So I think our goal is to bring all of these three sources into alignment. So they're all consistent with the, have the same information and um, that it's made clear that the only authoritative copy is the physical copy in town offices and the other two are just for informational use. So anything I've said that's inaccurate. Well, the um, there may have been updates made to this map, which is then exported uh, and put on by the people who add layers to our uh, assessors maps online that may not have uh, been updated at this point, but basically uh, the information on both the online GIS and this should be the same. Should be. Should be. But there's a lag time, right? I mean, you can get information to the ArcGIS people, but they don't. They, they, up, they update it right away. They do. Yeah, but I'm not sure which one they have at this point. Um, I've made some changes and um, I would ha have to take another look at it. But I'm still wondering, Judy, where is, um, is it true that you feel that this area here is commercial? I think some of that is, but I'm not sure. I don't remember the parcel numbers and I think you have to, 
I think one of one of Brian's comments is it would be helpful to have the parcels on the map rather than the topography. But that's that's a different issue. I think you need to go and look specifically at the Wendelowski parcel and make sure it's shown as AR AR1 uh, or as AGRES, whatever, whatever it is. It well that that parcel would be up here. Oh, that's not the parcel. Down here? No. Um, My name is Sandy. I'm the abutter to the property at, that Sue Monahan has. This section down here, which is Kyle's, you had approved as commercial. This section next to mine that loops around behind, that is still agricultural. And, and here? Yes, there and around the corner, which is abutting my property. That is Sue Monahan's, and that is supposed to be agricultural. It was my understanding that the lot that they wanted, that they bought was right in here. No. Well, I can't see anything that you're pointing at, so. John, if I could jump in, it's Rich Korpieski. I appreciate the opportunity here. If you look at that, parcel that shaded there's it looks like two structures within there yep all right the second structure north is the beginning of the second parcel right here no nope. go down right here right that's the beginning of the second parcel so if you go all the way back towards the pond it, it cuts it off yep it cuts it off and then and north of that barn should be agricultural one okay well that's an easy fix yes yeah well look Go back and look at the parcels. And yeah, it's just 24 and 24 one. What that one with the jog out in the second farther north barn, that's part of 24 two, and that's what was not approved. That parcel of Sue Monahan's was not approved at all for commercial. Right. Right. So I, I, I think that perhaps what happened is that. When I did this, um, I made an error and thought that it had been. Uh, so I will go ahead and fix that so it cuts it off there. All right, I'm, I'm, I know what I've got for my work cut out. So any other comments? So you're just welcome. to clarify, you're going to, so you're going to update this so that the right parcel, particularly the right commercial districts are right. shown. Gonna and then you're going the to zone. get this data into the GIS system, provide a new PDF, potentially if it can be I done. Don't, wait a minute, wait. Um, I don't know at what point it gets into the GIS system. We have to approve, have the map approved by the attorney general. Uh -huh. And I think that uh, Brian should certainly sign off and I don't know about anybody else. What, wasn't there a comment on his email about parcels being hard? Something about the top, topography. He said, using the topographic base map makes the zoning map extremely difficult to read or use. Not only are the elevation lines a distraction, but the other colors, light green in the base layer, make comprehending the map way more difficult. His, his last two comments are graphic design questions. They're not zoning or zoning like questions. It's about graphic design and interpretability of the, of the graphic presentation. Well, yeah, but he, he feels that the readability of it is important. Yeah, right, yes, absolutely. And then he said the diagonal hatching and vertical hatching for the active <laughs> overlay districts likewise, likewise makes the map difficult to read. So there's readability questions about the map and usability, and, and we should address those somehow. And maybe it's producing, I don't know, more than one version. <laughs> maybe we can ask Canna to check other towns overlay districts and how they're shown.
But so I want to understand, Judy, this process you're describing. So we can come up with a corrected map, and then this map needs to be submitted in some format to the attorney general's office with 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 anything, just a map. Well, it has with to go to it has to go to town meeting for <coughs> approval. Okay. Oh, that would be fun. Well, I don't know. It's just a. It will be just a routine vote. Lynn was Lynn before she resigned as town clerk was very concerned that some changes had been made that hadn't been uh, formally approved at town meeting, and and I'm not entirely sure what what I think it was a couple things where we found that a district was zoned differently than it was shown on the map and we corrected it, that kind of thing, but I'm not sure. But she felt that rather than, and this was back probably last December, she felt that rather than just having the, the addition of any changes we made approved for the map that we ought to just revote the whole thing. Okay. And, and that was before the the concerns about things that were incorrect that we we just talked about. So um, she had requested just just make sure make just make sure that everything has formally been approved. Um, okay. So is this something that we're doing at next annual town meeting in twenty twenty three? I think as we, as soon as we're ready, we take it to the next special town meeting. I mean, this what we're not doing is making any changes. We're ratifying past changes. Okay. We're not making any zoning changes. Yeah. We're just documenting the ones that we have already made. It should just be a pro forma vote. Okay. All right, so we have clear actions and timeline. Is that correct? I'll just work. Well, with the, I mean, I'll just work with the town clerk and get this straightened out. All right, I'm happy to help support that in any way I can, Don. Though you're the whiz at all the GIS systems. Well, do we want to find out how other people handle overlay districts or not? Well, I've looked at, at a lot of them, and uh, basically most towns use uh, quad sheets, which is what we're using, and then overlay all their other stuff on it. Um, the last official map that we had, we switched to aerial photographs, and uh, a lot of people um, didn't think that that was as useful as the quad sheets. And then there was a comment that some of the barns that are on these older quad sheets are no longer there. Uh, but uh, basically most well, of that the, doesn't really matter. Yeah. I will say I find this more legible than our last one with the green base. So thank you, Dawn. Yeah, I like it better myself. All right, so okay. moving on. Potential bylaw revisions. So Judy, I think you have some things. Is it, this may also be at just a time, especially with Rich uh, Korpuski on the line to uh, mention uh, the communication we've had with him and his response. Well, so maybe I'll take that as an opening. So um, at our last planning board meeting where we were debriefing on annual town meeting and the, uh, the failure to rezone the Monaghan parcel, uh, we, kind of, we noted that uh, Rich Kropit, and uh, Rich, I wanna make sure I'm pronouncing your last name yes, right. Yes. Is it, Korpieski, because I know Lisa, and she always said Korpieski. No, she always says Korpieski. Korpieski. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
Um, so we felt we should at least reach out to Rich because he wasn't sort of a de facto spokesperson for uh, residents in commercial districts and uh, how they are impacted by commercial businesses and the zoning that relates to that. And I think uh, Rich had a very reasonable response uh, and I'll yield the floor to Rich in a moment, but I'm just sort of summarizing that he felt that other abutter, other residents in the commercial district ought to be, we, we ought to reach out to them and solicit gen feedback generally about how people are feeling in the commercial and industrial districts and whether we should be considering bylaw changes and bylaw revisions to address their concerns. Is that a reasonable summary? Rich, would you like to expand on that in any way? The floor is yours. Yeah, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I thank you for the invitation. Um, as a lifelong resident of, of Waitley and living on Route 5, um, I, I realized that the character of Route 5 has changed you know, appreciably. And you always have the horse to yourself. There's some background, <laughs> sorry. And so what I was concerned about was this slippery slope that seems to be edging into town where uh, as the commercial interests start coming in um, and taking advantage of what Waitley has to offer and we have the ability to garner tax revenue from that, there seems to be a, uh, a liberal uh, uh, approach to utilizing bylaw and, and enforcement. And I know that there's a mechanism for enforcement in bylaws, but I know that what, what seems to be happening is an apathy to um, following the rules set by the board within the bylaws. And my concern with that was how it affects adjacent residential homes and how it will eventually, because the, the uh, commercial zone will eventually work its way north on Route 5, I'm sure within the next you know, 15, 20 years, maybe within the next five. And it's already encroaching or attempting to encroach its way up past on the other side of 91. And what happens is each and every resident who has who is adjacent to a, a potential commercial zone will have to deal with the consequences of the proprietor of that commercial zone and how they manage and what they believe their liberties can be uh, while they're utilizing that space. Um, I can speak of myself personally. Uh, I can speak of conversations I've had with other people uh, in just where, where their concerns were particularly in lighting and how lighting doesn't seem to follow uh, the bylaws in any particular way. Um, signage is questionable. Um, and noise and a buffer zone seem to be a concern. And I, I've talked with a number of people over the years concerning lighting into oncoming traffic. And, and it, what, the, the, the difficulty I have with it is there's a lot of discern, you know, discernment to it. Not a lot of people appreciate the excess lighting because what that's done is it's taken our rural town-like features of, of Waitley and it's changed it considerably. And then you drive through it and it's like you deal with it as you drive through it and you don't like it, but when you go home, you're fine until that shows up on your doorstep further north. And then that's my concern is each individual family has to deal with it. First, it starts with, you know, one building. Um, and, and again, I, I, I have to stress, I don't have, I don't have concerns or, or, or quarrels with, you know, the businesses on Route 5. Um, but I do have concerns of the precedent that's being set. Because what you, when you start setting a precedent of excessive lighting and this dark skies possibility that, we, that we're losing and will forever lose, that will, it, it's hard to tell a new business, well, you know, you got your lights shining into the oncoming traffic, it's shining on your neighbor's lawn and they'll complain, well, you know, other, other properties are doing that. Why are you complaining to me? So as we're losing the ability to enforce or expect that good practice should ensue, um, eventually what I see happening is as the commercial zone moves forward and moves north, 
that lighting problem becomes more egregious and more difficult to manage. What, you know, where the bylaws allow or don't allow for lighting um, to, to lead the property line. Yet, and then a certain lighting is, is considered uh, restricted, I would guess to say best way. But security lighting kind of moots the point of all of that. So once you decide to call it security lighting, then all of a sudden all the other factors that the um, planning board may have put in place during the planning process kind of disappear. So the bylaws are easily circumvented. And, and I think that um, enforcement is difficult. My conversations with the building inspector over the years uh, or as you know, Don was mentioning, I mean, he, his conversations with me were that it's difficult to assess what the planning board intends and how he is to enforce that intention. And uh, under a number of different factors, uh, one that came up in 2020 was uh, the public hearing of November 10th um, with my neighbor with the uh, uh, with a schoolhouse. And again, I, I have no quarrel with my neighbor, the good neighbor so far. But during that meeting, if you were to go back and, and revisit it, was at the beginning of the meeting, um, the idea of um, having a parking area 20 feet from a residential use. And the 20 feet indicated in the beginning of the meeting that the you'd have 20 feet it would be the burden of the prop of the business owner, the commercial interest. And then somewhere along during the meeting that moved to the boundary line. And the concern I have with things like that are that all buildings need to be 20 feet from a property line. So that bylaw is kind of a move point. It, it doesn't really provide any strength or, or there's nothing to it that allows any protections. So defining what a residential use is um, really helps identify what, how that bylaw would be implied. But on the same token, if I have a property that's my residential property and my yard is my residential use, how does the board define that versus the, the, my residential home, which has to be 20 feet away from the property line anyway? Mm -hmm. So there, there are places within the bylaws where I see it's difficult to enforce and it's difficult. It's easy to overlook. It's easy to uh, circumvent. And I think that what happens when you're dealing with residential homes on, on your way up through route five is each residential home will have to fight these same battles. And, and the mechanism that we use so far is to make the residential homeowner take charge against their neighbor. So you, what ends up happening is if your neighbor is not malleable to abiding by those changes, there becomes that conflict between neighbor and neighbor yeah. through the building inspector. And then that you, you struggle with the building inspector trying very hard to understand the direction of the board. And with that, um, there's a, a, a difficulty of being able to know what we can expect as residents. You know, and I think that what the board can do, I, I think we can all live together realistically, commercial zone with residential zone. But I think that by binding commercial properties to identify and, and making the bylaws so they are, that it's a lot easier to understand what the boundaries are, and a lot easier to enforce those boundaries, al allows the commercial zone to be able to have what they need without excess and allows the residential character to continue to be residential character. Because one of the things I see, and I, I up at the library, looking down in the valley during the you know, family day, I was thinking about what it would look like at night mm -hmm. and what would happen over the course of the next five, 10, 20 years when you completely engulf that area with commercialism and you have not checked the lighting or the noise or the hours of operation. And what you would see is, a, is what you see from UMass is this massive glow in the valley. 
and what you would see not during the summer would be enhanced during the winter. So it would start affecting everyone within the town. Mm. But by that point, it's too late. By that point, the complaints and the noise that you know, our neighbors are gonna have at that point, we can't do much about because we've already set the precedent that should have been addressed far earlier. Mm. And so by, by standing up, and speaking, what I realized was, and I, 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 to this day, I, I have no idea what I said. It just serendipitously came out. But what I realized by talking with other people after the fact was there's the folks who voted against the expansionism did so because they wanted to keep the character of Waitley a small town. And, and do, trying to keep that character a small town means that we have to put harnesses on liberties taken on the bylaws. You know, I can speak of, you know, local businesses that I struggle with trying to understand the excess of lighting. And I know security is an important factor, but there seems to be a, a willingness to extend that to, in, to impeach on the neighbors without consideration of the neighbors. And I think that once that it becomes a precedent and that works its way up Route 5, not only will the neighbors on Route 5 dealing with it, but also you folks up on the hill, you're gonna deal with it too because you're gonna have this massive glow and particularly in the winter time, because right here in the summertime, it's not, you know, it's tough. But in the winter time when there's no leaves, you know, particularly after snow, there's an awful lot of lighting. And then that peace and tranquility that pe brought everyone to Waitley will start to diminish and tear it apart. And I don't want to see that. You know, I've been a lifelong resident here and my family's been here and we've seen this change, but you know, Waitley was this amazing little wonderful town when I was a kid. Um, and it still is. And it still has this incredible potential, but not considering the effects of commercialism within the town and, and the liberties taken um, by the bylaws in, in that pursuit of commercialism will eventually come back to bite each and every one of us, I believe. And what I see, you know, with you know the expansion of the property that I was concerned about was that. We've taken one, you know, a, a, what was considered a home business that didn't become a home business because of liberties taken and because of conflicts with understanding how the building inspector would interpret one thing versus the board. And that conflict of interest, as I would see it, allows for this expansionism that, you know, becomes a little bit more than what was expected and if that continues if that proliferates eventually you'll start hearing the noise and you'll start realizing that most people don't want to be on route five or route five used to be you know the scenic route we used to be the scenic route and eventually we won't be the scenic route anymore and eventually people won't want to come down route five because it'll be like going down route nine if you have to then you have to, but if you can avoid it, just take 91. Mm. We'll lose that character. Yeah. And I don't think we want to do that. I think the vote and the, and the people that spoke to me after the vote, encouraging them, made me believe and understand that the town at large, even though it was a small demographic in the voting population, doesn't want to see that either. They don't want to see this proliferation take hold and, and, and air itself on uh, I don't want to say abuse because I don't think it's fair, um, but on liberties and those liberties that benefit, you know, a, a, a business owner that lives out of Waitley, who when they leave their business and they leave Waitley, you know, they go back to a nice dark space and they're comfortable where they are. Everybody else, we all have to live with the ramifications of what's left behind until the next day. Um, again, I don't want to, uh, I don't have any ill feelings for my neighbors. I, I, I want them to succeed. I want them to 
provide to the tax base. I want them to be productive parts of the community within Waitley. Um, and I want to encourage that as I think we all do, but I, I really, really think that the liberties taken are, are, are something that we need to rein back. We need to put more consideration within the bylaws to be able to protect that character that we're so easily losing. I mean, if you go down Route 5 in the middle of the night, you know, the light hits you in the face on a couple of occasions and a couple of different businesses. And all of a sudden, when you allow that to continue, when more business comes in and starts doing the same thing, eventually what you'll see is, you know, the glow of UMass on Route 5 Waitley. Rich, um, if, if I could interrupt you just a second. I'm, I'm hearing two threads in what you're saying. W one thread is actual taking um, residential land or a commercial or agricultural land and rezoning that into commercial uh, into commercial use. The other thread is what happens once that hap that takes place, that rezoning is taking place in the protection of abutters through bylaws. So, and what you're you're saying is there's an ine inevitability that if that 510 corridor is going to become commercialized. That, that's that, there, once that happens when, and you fine tune your bylaws the way you want them to, to take these things into effect that you've been describing, it's still, it's still going to impact the people living in a residential district. And if you look at in, in Hadley on Route 9, all the abandoned single family homes that are through there, um, that's because of they're following the bylaws, the commercial district are doing it, and not and it becomes it no longer becomes suitable in the ways that you're describing a small town waitly. And um, so I think once you turn that corner and say it's going to be commercial, it is going to be a commercial activity, and no, no matter how fine-tuned those bylaws are going to be, it's going to change the character. If you if you put in uh, a, 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 a store. It's going to have traffic coming in and headlights and all of that. Um, the question is, do you rezone it and allow those bylaws to be put to, to go into effect? And are you comfortable with that? So that, that's my observation of what you're saying. But I think there are two, two things that I'm hearing from you that are slightly different. One, um, the rezoning of land that's not commercial already into commercial. That's one step. And then two, the bylaws, once that has taken place, the bylaws within that commercial district that tries to maintain the character that you've been describing of a small town rural area. Well, if I can reflect on that, when I walk, drive through Route 5 in Hatfield, I notice that the signage um, is quite dull and almost difficult to read in some cases because their bylaws, if I understand correctly, allow or require that that lighting be muted where we don't necessarily have that would i also noticed that their um, parking lighting is muted as well it's not egregious and it, it it's not um, overly zealous in that respect and i think it's well enforced um, i don't believe that same thought i think that's what's encouraging people to come to waitley is that there's a laxed understanding of whether or something will be fully enforced and to what degree and how that gets enforced. And my concern is that what the system is now is you take and you place a property owner in conflict with their direct conflict with their neighbor, which isn't a good thing to do um, by making a complaint. And if, you're, if your neighbor, if the, if the commercial owner is, is reticent to make any changes without you know, being pushed, it's an awful uncomfortable place to do. And that's gonna be for every family moving north from here. And I, I know that from speaking with the people that I spoke to during the town meeting, that they don't want this expansionism to resemble Route 9, they don't. And that's why, all, that's why the vote reflected you know, what it did. And I think that if the board recognizes that there's a need to keep the small town feel and puts guardrails within the bylaws and enforcements within the bylaws that allow 
for that small town feel to continue, um, we'll be a lot happier as a whole. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned as a lifelong resident. I'm concerned of, of seeing those abandoned houses on Route Nine and what that can, how that will reflect here. It very easily could, and I know that there's a larger part of Waitley that's um, residential that isn't affected by commercialism. Actually, most of the town isn't convert from, you know, isn't affected by commercialism. There is a minimum amount of homes that are, but we still are your neighbors. We still pay our taxes. We still you know, get involved in town events when we have able to, um, and we still matter and we should still count. And um, I would hope the board would, you know, reiterate that same affection. Um, so I'd like to just thank, take a moment to thank you, Rich, for sharing all of this. I've taken notes. I don't think we were planning or expecting tonight to, you know, fully, I think we're not going to fully discuss this. We're not going to make any decisions tonight about this. I think you've given us a lot to think about. And I think you've also through your email made a recommendation that I think is a very good one that I intend to take you up on and, and I may enlist your help uh, in, in executing, but finding a way to engage all, at least reach out to all of those um, residing in the commercial district to, to get their perspectives on this as well. Because I've been hearing comments about concerns about enforcement I mean, where there's, and we could have a long discussion, which we're not going to about, how enforcement is or is not done in Waitley um, and how that might or might not be improved. I have specific concerns about zoning bylaws and enforcement of bylaws as they relate to lighting and noise and uh, things like that. I, I definitely noted the phrase liberties taken used multiple times in your comments. So this is all, um, I think, very helpful. Um, so Rich, I, would, I have, before you, <laughs> I have, specific question. The one commercial enterprise that I can think of that the planning board has approved that's operational in the last 10 years is muffins. Um, do you have issues with, with the lighting or noise there? You speaking to myself? Yeah. Yeah, I think the lighting is excess excessive. I think that uh, it could be, it, it, if, if the bylaws require it to not leave the, the property in the boundaries, and as you can see driving through there, it obviously does. And it's not supposed to be into oncoming traffic, which is a concern for many, and then it does. And I think that the, um, you know, it reflects onto adjacent properties. I know that I have to you know, deal with windows and issues. And my con my conversations with the owner was, his response was just to get a shade. Um, I try to find a um, diplomatic way of addressing it and then try not to be in conflict with my neighbor because I don't want to be. Um, <clears throat> I know I have every right to be, but I find that in, in the best interest of getting along within the town, unfortunately, it puts me in conflict with them. It doesn't do me. No, you've made that point. I just just yeah, right. But, to my, but, but the, the, light, the you. light, you know, I've got we've got additional signage, lighting, you know, reflecting onto adjacent properties, into oncoming traffic. There's screening that was supposed to be placed there, and noise because of lack of screening. Um, again, I, I'm struggling because I don't want to place. I don't want to focus on that concern in general. I wanted to be more general about mm -hmm. all of it instead of focusing on my grievances because I think my grievances are mine. And yes, I would hope the board would take consideration of those, but also my biggest concern is how that proliferates and becomes a precedent that works its way throughout the town at this point. And when, you know, once we set a precedent, it's difficult to change that precedent. And once you know many people set the same precedent and take those same liberties, it becomes harder and harder and harder. And I understand what the board's trying to do. The board is trying to make it attractive for, for businesses to come in the way. And I agree that I, I applaud that. But on the same token, we can't sacrifice good practice, you know, and, and 
if somebody's going to be a good neighbor, they should be a good neighbor. Uh, and Thank I, you. Okay, that's great. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Okay. And I'd you. like uh, to make one other clarification, please. Uh, this is Sandy. Yep. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, Judy said about the uh, recent commercial was last one was was muffins. You also approved Kyle Monahan's to commercial as well. No, we approved the zoning change after the build after the after the project was established. We didn't. We never formally approved the project, and well, that was a dispute with the. Yes. Yes, there was um, a problem actually with the, the planning. project. It was built. It was built as a home occupation. Correct, but it is not. It is now commercial. It is now zoned commercial, but I don't believe the occupation has changed. I don't think the business itself has changed. If, if I can jump in here, this is one of the concerns that I have is, is this type of, you know, if we create, allow home occupation, a circumventing of the bylaws by creating a home occupation that resembles a, a, a full-blown commercial. And, and I know it, it worked out for the town that we've created commercial space and we've got the commercial. I don't think that the planning board is all happy with this situation. I'm sure. Um, but that all the more reason why I speak up to you know encourage the planning board to consider uh, if there's and any actually there. we would have had well I guess I'll stop there that's not true never mind Judy do you got any other bylaw revisions you would like to speak about well I did talk to Peggy Sloan about the home occupation one and the draft that I had showed the group last time. And she had some concerns with it. And we wrestled with it for about half an hour and decided that it was virtually impossible to come up with a meaningful definition, um, definition or, a, or a restriction, I guess is the word, for, for adult use products. And she did agree that she thought that it was highly unlikely given the expense and onerous requirements of the CCC that marijuana delivery would ever, or courier would ever be, especially delivery would ever be a home occupation. So I think unless somebody senses that groundswell of desire within the town to, to impose such a, to try and put a restriction in, I'd, I'd prefer to just leave it for now. Well, I, I see that as a home occupation simply because all you are doing is getting stuff in on your computer um, and saying it needs to go to this person. So basically, bringing marijuana into the town is probably not even going to happen. It's just going to be exactly like a delivery service where you go pick up something and take it somewhere else. And, you know, it, it just, that portion of it never, never really came through. It's basically just a, a computer based operation completely as far as the home goes, but uh, so many people are so averse to anything marijuana that um, it's pretty easy to, to uh, assume that it's evil, evil. And I mean, I'll get off my soapbox at this point. My issue, I don't think I have a problem with delivery. Courier brings up safety issues for abutters. Um, so I'm delivery, long as you're picking it up somewhere, delivering it, and that's it but it's the courier where you're storing it in your home that there's- I think it's actually flipped, Sarah. I okay, and del it's delivery I have the problem with, it's where courier. Where there's intermediate storage. Yes, I knew it was probably- it's Really flipped. hard to keep straight. Yeah, yes, the ones where you store it in your home, yeah. I think brings up 
safety issues for neighbors in terms of security and how somebody is securing those things in their mm -hmm. home. Yeah, I agree with that. Would if, that be, but is that different than say firearms or alcohol? Or? No, because I think the marijuana goes with, will automatically go with firearms. Well, I mean. Right, I do mean, they. So I am the proud owner of firearms. Um, they are yeah, but you're not. No, but you're not. You're not retailing firearms exactly, or, or wholesaling. But you're not. You're but not conducting. I don't think you're going to have the delivery, the one that's in your home. You're not going to have that without firearms. No, no. I'm saying a business that say. Oh, see, I uh, say say you sell you antique guns. Look, we're not, if with a firearms business, we can put many conditions on it in many reasons. But if it's a, the storing marijuana in your home, there's no well, restrictions no. on the guns of somebody else. Assume a it's a home occupation. Right. Firearms business. What restrictions can we put on? True. We have none, you know, there's no, people can just leave them loose in their basement, big bags of ammunition, and just sell them. <laughs> and you look FedEx at our home comes and takes them away, FedEx. Right. Yeah, me, I thought you were saying, Sarah, that if you're going to have a home occupation marijuana delivery business and store marijuana in your basement, you're also going to have firearms to defend your stash of marijuana. <laughs> right. And that leads to yeah, I don't have I have less of an issue with firearms not involving marijuana. So <laughs> it's when you get them together, yeah, and alcohol that issues happen. Yeah. So. Let's move on to the approval of minutes. I concur with that. I do think we should continue to have this discussion at our next regular meeting about potential bylaw revisions. I want to just before we ran out mention that. Um, uh, one of the manufact one of the marijuana operations in town did ask me a question of what's our position or what's Waitley's position on social consumption of marijuana. Oh, I meant to bring that up too. Yeah, so we may have to. Now's not the I time. Would, I, <laughs> no, one I think thing should, I, I think we need to do is to clarify our retail marijuana use to specify that it does not include social consumption be or on-site consumption, because that's not clear now. And I'm sure that wasn't intended. Um, I think it's pretty clear that where you sell it, you cannot smoke it. No, it's not in our bylaw. And the, the way the CCC, CCC is written is that um, as long as you have a, a retailer can have a social club license. So um, I think we need to specify that retail does not include on-site consumption. I think we have a couple of years to do that. There are two, there are two separate categories though. You need the, the social, you cannot, unless you make your retail place also adjoining us a social you can you can you can't light up in a, in a store period Legal. i'm not so so we should figure this out but maybe we not should tonight. figure this out we need to understand wheatley smoking yeah regulations which i don't know it's also um i believe reading some of our um applicants in towns blogs or messages to the public when they're recruiting fundraising funds there's been things about said about oh stop by any time and oh yes we're looking forward to putting in a having a social place for consumption and this is happens to be the one next door to me which is a strictly growing facility so i think there's a lot of not understanding of whether that is just a sales pitch or very much not understanding definitely in the public of the 
what is allowed at certain places. So. All right. All right, so we're gonna now approve some minutes, right, Don? Minutes. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, great job, Mary. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'll just kick this off by um, making a motion. So I know that Judy and I have both reviewed, I'm just getting the minutes of, I think it was, uh, it was the first one was February 10th that just came out. And so Judy and I, they, my own impression, Mary, is you did a great job. Minimal changes were needed. Judy made markups. Everything's in the OneDrive with her initials and mine and the file name. So I'm gonna move that we approve the minutes of the February 10th meeting as amended. Second. All right. We're still chairing this, Don, so you can do your magic. Pregnant pause. So, all right, the, the, the motion has been made and seconded. So we're gonna do a vote, yes, to approve the minutes. Don, go for it. I think Don can't hear us. Really? I, I didn't uh, follow what? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you, so we, the motion has been made and seconded to approve the minutes of the February 10th meeting as amended. Right. So we're doing a vote. Go ahead, Don. Okay. Sarah? Aye. Don, aye. Tom? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brent? Aye. Motion passes. Yay. All right. Uh, so, and then the next one. So, yeah, that's interesting. Did we have a meeting on February 22nd? Or was that the one that got couldn't be held? Because there's I think a if it's if it's on March 10th, it was because it was postponed from February 22nd, probably. How could a meeting on March, February 10th be postponed from a meeting on February 22nd? No, isn't it March 10th? Where am I? No, we're not there yet. So we just did oh. February 10th. And but actually, March, we had, March had a meeting scheduled a on February 8th, and that was moved to February 10th. So we've approved February 10. We have a meeting folder for February 22nd. But did we have a meeting? There were no minutes for February 22nd. Well, I'm wondering why we had one in the middle of the month on March 10th. So I suspect that the February 22nd one was postponed till the 22nd, but I can't. Didn't we have a meeting the, the power went out? I, I don't have <laughs> my, my the notebook. Power go out at one of the meetings and we, we couldn't convene? Maybe. That was, I'm looking at the agenda for February 22nd. And we were going to continue the public hearing for green jeans and do a public hearing for the uh, large scale solar development bylaw change. I think there was that one was the problem with the Zoom link. Okay, so we did not have a meeting on the, we didn't actually have a meeting. We had a scheduled meeting on February 22nd, but we didn't actually meet. So there are no minutes. It's when the meeting IDs were confused. Okay, so then the next set of actual minutes that Mary circulated are for March 15th. And again, Judy and I have reviewed them and annotated them. So I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of March 15th as amended. Seconded. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Call for a vote, Sarah. Aye. Don, aye. 
Brad? Aye. Judy? Aye. Tom? Aye. Motion passes. It, it does. Let me just also confirm that was not the one with the, the weird word about the evergreen tree. No, that's the next one. Okay, good. All right, good. So, good. So now we're on to April 26th. And that was the one I noticed because Judy added a comment. Is that the one? Just question what the word was. It's a description of a spruce, but I didn't. Oh, know. yeah. It was, there was a word in the minutes, Mary. You know what? Can you give me a page? Yeah, it was page in the Word document. It looks like it's. Well, your page numbers don't align with the yeah. Word. It's okay. it's page six. Six is at the bottom of the page. Okay. So it's and it's in the part five update on landscaping at one thirty four Christian Lane. You used the word replacement of a con color spruce, and I, I think in my notes I assumed that was part of its name. Ah, it is. It is that, a con is color new. is the, I believe it's a fir. It is the variety of the tree. It's got very long needles. Oh, is really? it properly spelled? Is that I the way you spell it? Con color, C-O-N-C-O-L-O-R. They're really, yeah, really nice little trees. All right, I learned something today. Me too. So is, so Sarah, <coughs> as an expert on this, so is the proper description a con color spruce? Let me. Confirm if it's a spruce or a fir. So I'm going to delete my a fir, con color fir. A con color. So I'm going to change the word spruce to fir. Yep. And, and actually, I'm going to, since somebody, I think, anyway, I'm just going to put con color. C O N C O L O R. Yes. Okay. So I've just made that change in the minutes. I know I'm not sharing my screen, but you can all trust me. So other than that. Okay, under adjournment, uh, is Brand still Brand with a D? Under adjournment. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, dear. Sorry, I fixed that. Good catch. Um, so that's also changed. So I will now with that. Oh, and since we're talking about these minutes, those are the minutes where Larry Brotherton of 83 State Road came before and asked for feedback on his plan. And then he sort of disappeared. I have been in touch with him and he does want us to keep this open. He's planning on coming back and making progress. So we should, he understands that we haven't signed his application. So it, it just remains open. Gentlemen. Yes. Okay. But other, but basically I'm, I'm moving to approve the minutes of our April 26th meeting as amended. Second. Second. Okay. Hi. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, Tom? Aye. Don, aye. Sarah? Yes. Brent? Aye. Judy? Judy? Aye. <laughs> okay. Aye. All right, we're up to date. We're now Yay. well within the zone of uh, compliance with the open meeting law. Thank you very much, Mary. <coughs> You're welcome. We will so, be when they're posted. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's true. I will finish them off and get them over. Wonderful. Okay. I think we're at the end of our agenda, Don. I think so. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So I'll moved. Second that. Okay, Sarah moved and Judy seconded, or maybe the other way, but I don't care. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Being is adjourned. Okay. Aye.